Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Scott. This is Calculus uh, One. Uh, here it's the fifteenth of April. Uh, happy Tax Day, everyone. Um, I am Scott Grizzard from the University of South Florida. Um, so today we're going to be talking about antiderivatives and estimating the area under the curve function. Today we're going to like so we're going to do some problems and then we're going to try to get at the intuition. Next time, we're actually going to do the formal definition of the integral, which is what the AUC function turns out to be. Uh, but not uh, that that is that's one of these technical definitions that the 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 what's happening right the the understanding is much easier than the formal writing of it. Uh, the formal writing of it is just a pain in the neck. So what we're going to do today is we're going to get at the intuition. Next time, we'll figure out the formal writing of it. But it's it's easier to, to figure out the formal writing if you play with it some. So that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to use Riemann sums to estimate uh, AUC today, and then uh, and we're going to play around with antiderivatives. Um, next time, we're actually going to do the formal definition of the Riemann sum, and then the formal definition of the integral, uh, which is equal to the AUC function under certain circumstances. OK, are there any questions? Certainly quiz will come first, okay? Uh, and we have a TA in, uh, in chat, so uh, there is, uh, he can answer questions for you as well. Um, also, did everyone see this assignment that's up? There is this thing called the, uh, so, you know, um, there was this big argument, if you care about the, the machinations that go on behind the teaching of calculus, on whether or not we should curve the exam. And, you know, the, 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 the people who got really low scorings were like, yeah, let's curve. And people who, you know, were high were like, oh, let's not curve for free. Um, or, you know, there was one person who's like, no, 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 no. So, um, you know, the, the, what was settled on as a compromise was basically the activity that I gave uh, basically the problem set that I gave you after uh, uh, two, um, which is actually kind of nice because that means that you uh, get to great, do your, um, do a test, you know, you get to correct your problems, but you also get 10 points. Now, these 10 points are not attached to a particular test. They just, you know, if, if your test three would not be dropped, then you get 10 points there. If test three would be dropped, the points will transfer to the other test. Okay? So you get to keep your test your test things. Now, there's issues about the key. Um, obviously, the, the rubric for test three is on grade scope. So when you got your thing back, like the first page told you the rubric. Now, some of those are confusing. Um, but obviously, I'm not going to release, you know, you've seen part of the key, basically. You got hints at it, or in some cases, full. Um, but I'm not releasing the key until after uh, Monday when the assignment is. So the assignment's due Sunday night. On Monday, I'll give you a formal key. Um, and I actually have to rewrite it because there's four mistakes on the key that I did not do. So, yeah. Okay. And then, yes, if you forget to mic, mute your, your mic on the class channel, I will uh, uh, mute it for you. Um, and the TA can do so as well. Um, he, 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 he. So the assignment is due on... So let me bring it up. So the assignment is due Sunday night. Uh, now, every instructor is doing something different. Some instructors have said it only goes on test three. Some instructors have only said do four. Um, I said do five. Uh, let me pull it up. Uh, if I do this, is it going to... Yes. Uh, so as you can see on the assignment, the thing is due on uh, Sunday, April 19th at midnight, 11.59. So p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I know that some of you are spread all over the place. Um, the purpose is, of course, to do this. What you need to do is you need to do pick five questions that you missed. I highly advise you to pick the ones that you did the worst on. Um, and here's why. The final exam is cumulative, okay? But you get 10 points either way. Um, 
Is there a web assigned due tonight? There is not. There will be due one due tomorrow night. I want you tonight to play with this tester, you know, to start this thing uh, up. And because, and then uh, there's also a shortened problem set for Friday. So the the whole, I really want you to work on this. Um, but I did make it due on Monday. Um, also, if you'll notice on Gradescope, I dug out your test three, or your test one scans, and I posted them to Gradescope. So everyone should be able to access their test ones. If I could figure out where the test twos, where I put the test two scan files, I will post those as well. Uh, so you can have them for studying for the final, because I know people have uh, uh, left the test somewhere in their dorm. They've got it in a box somewhere. They don't remember. Oh, shoot, I left it in my storage unit. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and return. Basically, I'll return everything that I can find, um, get my hands on. So the idea here is that what you need to do is correct your thing. So just like last time, but this time, if you only missed one part of question three, you still have to do the whole page of question three, uh, all the parts, okay? Does that make sense? Um, and then you can circle the which one you're doing. One to five, how do we feel about understanding what you need to do for this assignment? Um, and it's worth 10 points on a test, okay? Uh, can I get a one to five? Do I get a one to five? Okay, so I don't get a one to five. I'll do it. Up oh, there we go. One to five. How do we feel about this assignment? Okay, so we understand the assignment. We're happy with it. Um, that looks very nice. So if you missed um, only one part and you choose to do it, you have to do all parts on the back. Um, also, if you miss, if you run out of test three questions, go for test one questions. If you run out of approved questions uh, that you missed, go for. Um, do you know, do stuff that's not on the list, okay? So no, no, no getting out of it by saying I didn't miss any. All right, you don't get points for that. Go find something you missed and put it on there. Um, so if you miss something from test one, circle it. Do the parts. Obviously, you only have to do three parts from part three if you choose this page or this page, uh, because part th you know, if I told you to do the whole question, it's huge. Um, uh, and then it's got the usual stuff. Where was it? Write the full solution. Um, and there are five questions. And it's worth, I actually computed it out. It's worth one, uh, almost, it's like 1.45 something. It's worth almost a point and a half on your final grade. Uh, just pure extra credit uh, is what it turns out to be. Because that's what 10 points uh, on a test works out to be. Um, and again, if test three is the one that's dropped, it's, it's basically going in as a test score out of zero, right? So it, it, you get to keep the points even if you drop test three. So um, so do this assignment, please. Um, also, there is also the matter of the Nego lecture. I have decided upon a thing for that. You will be happy about it. You will be fine with the assignment. Um, it will require um, exactly... Uh, uh, it will require about 15 minutes of your time. Uh, what I'm going to do is everyone who fills out my course evaluation, which should start either next week or the following week, it's the week before finals, I think, um, or two weeks before finals. Anyone who fills out the course evaluation, and I'll show you, uh, there'll be a place to upload it, will get the extra point. So that's how I'm going to do the extra point. I'm going to have you fill out my course evaluation because I imagine that my response rate is going to actually be, if I don't do this, my response rate will be pretty low because, you know, everyone's remote. Um, so I can't pester you to do it in the middle of class. So this way you get your point. I get course evaluations because I want my percentage to be high. Um, and I actually get good feedback, which I want. Um, my boss gets good feedback about me, um, hopefully, or bad feedback. or Well, good in the sense of he's got good data. Um, I, hope, I hope he liked me, but, you know, uh, it's up to you what to give me on the, on the review. Um, so, and then that way, um, that way there's, uh, that way everybody's kind of works out for everybody. Any questions? Other questions? Okay, so that's what's going on. That, there's the, the curve is an assignment. Uh, but again, instead of just a test curve where you, you know, you lost it if you dropped test three, here you keep the points. So please do it. Um, especially if you did poorly on test three. If you did really poorly on test three, remember this thing is cumulative. Um, if you missed the um, the optimization problem, and by missed it, I mean missed it, not like, oops, 
you know, a point off. If you really miss that optimization problem, please do that as one of your problems um, because that's really important. It's like uh, that's actually a really important concept. Um, also, if you missed, um, uh, uh, if you're missing graphs, please do graphs. Uh, get those right. Um, I know one of those graphs was really, really tricky on the test, um, and I will go over that one uh, in one of the review sessions. I'll announce that. I actually will go through this test uh, to show you how to do stuff, and I'll go through the others as well. I don't know when, uh, but there will be a special session for that. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. So, yes. Okay, so let's go over the quiz. Okay, the first one, state the fundamental theorem of calculus. As I said, this is going to be on every quiz until we're done. And a lot of people said, oh, that's the thing I remembered from the last class. Really? Okay, um, so, all right. That's the thing you remember? That's the thing you remember. Um, yes, this will be on every quiz. You can guarantee it on the test. Um, there are several ways to write it. Um, there's two that I gave. I gave one, a different one to the 930 than I gave to the 11. They're absolutely equivalent. There's also a way to write it from the book. Please don't use the book one. I mean, you can, it's legal, but the one in the book is actually more confusing, um, in some sense because, and it's not as good. Uh, this is actually, this version of the fundamental theorem of calculus is more powerful. Um, so, you know, you can use the one in the book. You will get full credit. Uh, yes, the graders will be nitpicking you on every little bit. You have to remember, is it the closed interval? Is it the open interval? This is just, you don't have to remember those things, right? But, you know, if you already memorized the one in the book because you've taken calculus again, you're taking calculus again, um, you know, who am I to judge? Uh, shoot. I don't know why my, my thing isn't synced. Um, okay, so one to five, how do we feel about this? So there's several ways to write it. Um, this right here, I think in this class, I took this thing and I stuck it here. And that's also perfectly fine. Okay, FTC where G prime equals F for all X and D. That is a legal way to write it. This is also legal. Okay, so this condition is really attached only to FTC2. So you could stick it here. Um, and that's fine. And FTC one just stands on its own. Uh, or you can stick it, uh, in as a condition. Either way is perfectly legal and fine. Uh, okay. Now I can't see the one to fives. So, okay. We feel good about this. Um, okay. It's synced at last. I hope this is not a harbinger. There's technical issues all day, and I hope this is not a harbinger of what's happening. All right, let's do these general antiderivatives. So the idea, I wanted you to play with it before we talked about it in class. to kind of get an impression about what's going on. Um, so this idea of a general antiderivative, first thing let's talk about is an antiderivative. How do I do this? The key to the power rules, and I'll talk about the other ones in class today, but the key to the power rules is to deal with the exponent first. Um, all right. It's not writing. So the key to the power rules is to deal with the exponents first. Let me show you what I mean by this. So right now I've got F of x equals x cubed plus 2. Now, 
I'm going to write, I can write this any way I want to. Uh, the traditional thing is to use a capital F. I'm not the biggest fan. Um, I prefer a capital A because that's actually saying what it is. But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, when you're dealing with multiples, the capital letters are nice. So if I've got an F running around and a G running around, the capital letters actually are nice. Um, but uh, if I don't, if I'm only dealing with one, I prefer the A. But okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with the exponent first. Now the exponent here is a Q. So what I'm going to wind up with is an X to the fourth, right? Because when I do the subtraction. I wind up with a three. How do we feel about that one to five? When I subtract one, when I take the derivative, I wind up with a three. Yeah. So I'm gonna deal with it first. Now I'm gonna think, if I took the derivative of x to the fourth, what would wind up in front? Four. So I need to deal with the 4. And the way that I deal with the 4 is I put a 1 quarter in front of it, right? Because then I get rid of that. Does that make sense? So when I take the derivative now, I'm going to lose that 4. That 4 becomes a, that 4 that goes in front is knocked out by the 1 fourth and I'm left with an x cubed. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing for the next one. I'm going to remember that this is really x to the 0 here. So when I go up, I'm going to add 1. I'm going to have an x to the first. OK? Now, when I bring down the 1, there's only going to be a 1 here, and I need a 2. So I need to multiply this bit by 2 so that when I take the derivative, I wind up with a 2 that's left. And then, because this is a general antiderivative, as opposed to a, uh, as opposed to any antiderivative, I ask for the general one. And because I want the general antiderivative, I'm going to add a c for a constant. Okay? And I'm going to talk about this today, um, what that thing is. Um, because the general antiderivative isn't just a function, it's actually a family of functions. It's a set of functions, and I'll talk about what that means. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check my answer. So I get f of, oops, f of what? Okay, I don't know why it did that. f of x equals, so now I'm going to get 4 times 1 fourth times x to the 4 minus 1 plus 2 times x to the 1 minus 1 plus 0. And that equals x cubed plus 2 zero, which is the exact same thing as I had here. Okay. How do we feel about that problem, one to five? Okay. Now I want to compute AUC. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to do this, okay? So AUC F0 of X equals, now I'm going to say it's um, by FTC2, and I could write this several ways. I could write this with the capital F, but remember that capital F is really a, a uh, a family of functions. I'm going to pick one. So I'm going to say g of x minus g of 0 where g of x equals uh, 1 fourth x to the fourth plus 2x. 
Okay, so I'm going to pick one. I don't need a C anymore. The C, who cares? I need an antiderivative, as opposed to the whole family of functions. So this is an antiderivative for f. And that equals here 1 fourth x to the fourth plus 2x minus 1 fourth times 0 to the fourth plus 2 times 0, which equals 1 over 4 x to the fourth plus 2x. Okay, and yes, you have to write this step. That highlight does not look good, does it? Oops. Um, and this should actually be a minus sign, shouldn't it? Um, and yes, you do need to write this step. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. So issues about that, of course, can be addressed uh, by the graders. Um, how much credit? You do lose a little bit for, you know, copying down the question wrong. Uh, not much. Uh, any other questions about this? One to five, how do we feel about this process? Did I mess up something in the notes? Is that what I'm hearing? That is entirely possible. It is entirely possible that I messed it up when teaching, in which case I feel really bad. No, I did it right in the notes. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Let's look at the notes. Yes. So I took an antiderivative. That was the G. Um, so where was G? Yes. Uh, F of X equal 2X. That gave me a G of X of X squared plus 5. I don't care what it is. Okay. So here was F and here was the G. So I was computing AUC of F and I used G. Uh, and that's right there. Um, that was from the notes for this class. Let me check the notes for the second version. And then this was the example I did for the second which was doing g of x. What was my g here? 
my G here was one quarter. Right, so on this class I did, on this one I did X cubed and I did one quarter. Uh, so yes, my notes were correct for both. Um, okay, so we can talk about it in, uh, in chat uh, after, but you, I need to kind of move on. Um, so you didn't have to use big F of X. You just had to use something whose derivative was little f, okay? Um, so what you had to do was something whose derivative was little f. And little f was, in this case, X cubed. So you need the thing to be, you need the derivative of your G to be little f. So a function whose derivative, and that's what was on here, right? And then for uh, the last one, that was here. You see, I got, give me a function whose derivative is 2x. We said x squared plus 5. So I then did that in the notes. Okay. I noticed there's some confusion in here. I'll address a little bit more of this and... Since there is confusion, I will talk about this some more. Um, but this idea is I need a G whose derivative is F. Okay. All right. So uh, let's move on to the other problem. Uh, we'll come back to this since that seems to be uh, 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 a source of confusion. We'll have to come back to it. Okay. This is exactly the same thing as the question from test three. Uh, so it's actually the exact same question that I put in the uh, on the quiz, except now I've got, I want to answer things about the derivative. I mean, not the derivative, about the AUC. Okay. So here, remember that if F, so if F, is here. Here's f prime and here's f double prime, right? And remember that if f is increasing, f prime is going to be positive. And if f is concave up, really? The whole thing just decided it hated me. Okay. If F is concave up, that means F prime is increasing, and that means F double prime was positive. Well, now we're going to stick a new function on top of this, right? Because A, by FTC1, A, the area function, the derivative of this is this. So this is actually a prime. This is actually a double prime here. So that means that when F is positive, A is increasing. And when F is increasing, A is concave up. How do we feel about that, 1 to 5? So let's look at what's going on here. I'm going to make a few notes down here. I'm going to talk about F, F, and then I'm going to talk about A, A. Now here, F is positive and decreasing. Here, F is positive but decreasing. I actually need more space, don't I? Uh, let's see. Here, F is positive. Let me do it in there. Positive, but decreasing. Here, F is positive, but decreasing. Here, F is negative and decreasing. Here, F is negative and decreasing. Here, F is negative, but increasing. And here, F is positive and increasing. How do we feel about that, 1 to 5?
So that means that this thing's derivative here, a is the derivative of this. So that means that a, if f is positive, if the a prime is, if a prime is positive, that means a is increasing. And since a prime is decreasing, that means that a is concave down. Here, f is positive, which is a prime, so that means I'm increasing concave down. I'm still decreasing. Well, now I've got a negative. Now I've got a negative for f, or a prime. So now I've got decreasing in a, concave down. I've got decreasing here, concave down. Here I've still got decreasing, concave up. And here I've got increasing, concave up. Okay. How do we feel about that now, one to five? Okay. And this makes sense if you think about it, because think about it, I'm gonna start, forget about this fact that I've said the base point is negative one for a moment, and let's start from negative one and just look at that, okay? This makes sense because if I'm starting here, right, as I move to the right, I'm adding positive area. And then as I move more to the right, I start adding negative area. And then as I keep moving to the right, I'm adding negative area, so I'm decreasing. And then as I move to the right here, I'm still decreasing because I'm adding negative area. And then when I get here, I start adding positive area again. Okay, the base point is the point from which I'm starting. Okay, and I'll get to that in just a moment. How do we feel about this one to five now? Okay. So from my notes, I wind up, so to justify this, somewhere I need to write the statement for everything, notice that a prime equals f by FTC one. Somewhere I need to mention the fundamental theorem of calculus, and I need to mention that what I'm looking at is a prime. And I could do that anywhere. I could write it here. I could write it right. I could write right here that this is equal to a prime. I could write it here. I could do the little chart. Um, somewhere I need to write a prime, and then somewhere I need to say FTC. So if I wrote FTC right here, that would be enough. Okay, just somewhere I need to write FTC. Okay, FTC one. So I'm decreasing over the interval, zero one, I'm sorry, zero three, I'm looking at the points, zero three, because that's where my derivative is negative, which means my A is, is, is decreasing. And I'm in, and, uh, because that's where that's negative. And then the critical numbers are zero and three because that's where the thing crosses the x-axis. Uh, there are no places where it's not defined. Um, however, there is kind of a weird thing where the, it won't let me move stuff. Uh, there we go. What values am I concave down? And then the values are where I'm concave up. I'm sorry, where I'm, I have local maximums. Okay, so how do we feel about this question, one to five?
No, it's actually negative 2. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. That's a very good question. Okay? That is a very good question. So what about this thing? What happens if I'm left of the base point? That's the question. So before we had this situation, And you know this bit, but that's FTC1. You know from FTC1 that the derivative of A is F. And that was the whole point of FTC1. All right, so my, okay, so let's see if I can get this thing to, to do it. Uh, it's thinking about working again. Yay, it worked. Uh, okay, so let's look at this situation here, okay? If I'm left, so if I start at my base point here, right, here my base point is 2. So, and my function here, which should be displayed and is not, is just f of x equals x. Okay? Is everyone on board with this situation? So, as I move to the right, as I sweep right, as I keep going this way, as I keep going this way, I'm going to be adding area under the curve. Is everyone on board with that? As I move forward, my AUC here is increasing as I add area. One to five, how do we feel about that? Okay. Now, here's the question. How do I define being left of the base point? Okay, I want some way to define being left of the base point. Now, negative area is actually something that in physics is easy to understand. Um, so we have things like negative displacement. You're going the other direction. Okay, but negative, but being left of the base point, I'm going to define it in such a way, uh, it's such a way to make this thing consistent, okay? So the way that I'm going to define area left of the base point is as follows. If I'm left of the base point, I'm going to have negative area become positive area and positive area become negative area. Let me show you what that means. So when I start this, if I start on the left, so here, my base point is zero. So AUC F0, F2 of zero, I'm left of the base point, and as I sweep right, right when I'm left of the base point, I have negative area if I would have had positive area otherwise. So left of the base point, negative area above the x-axis, positive area below the x-axis. How do we feel about that one to five?
Now, but watch what happens as I move left to right. Okay, as X increases, what happens to AUC? Notice that it's getting less negative. As I close in on the endpoint, okay, I'm taking away negative area. Okay, so right now I'm left of the endpoint, but as I close in, as I move to the right, as I get closer and closer to my endpoint, I lose negative area because I'm above the x axis. In other words, my AUC becomes less negative. Okay? So as I move to the right, my AUC becomes less negative. And then when I'm at the endpoint, when I'm at my base point, the AUC is zero because I've got no area, because I've got no width. How do we feel about that one to five? So as I move to the right, right, exactly, it changes. So positive area becomes negative, I'm sorry, negative area becomes positive area, and positive area becomes negative area at the base point. It changes. Okay? This way, as I move to the right, it's consistent, right? Given the fundamental theorem of calculus, we now want to define area left of the base point in a way that makes it consistent with this idea. And to do that, what I do is I let it that negative area become positive and positive negative. Now, let me show it to you here. Oh, joy. Control exit. Let me show you another example. It's thinking about it. Okay. While it's thinking about that, let me just put it here on the thing. Okay, so oops, I need to change this to the notes. So if I'm left of the base point, I get negative area above and positive area below. That way, as I move to the right, I take away negative area. And that makes it consistent with FTC1. Okay, so if I'm looking at the whole thing, this is what I wind up with. Right now, I'm left at, so, oops, I'm not showing the base point, and now I'm not showing anything. Now it's all mussy. Okay, so here my base point is zero. When I'm left of the base point and below the axis, I've got positive area. Now, but as I sweep, I remove that positive area. Now, as I move to the right more, I'm removing the negative area and now I'm adding more. And now I'm adding area, right? As I sweep to the right, I start adding. And at first, I'm adding positive area, and then I'm adding negative area. How do we feel about that, one to five? Okay. 
But that gives us this interesting property, okay? And that gives us this property. Remember before we had a formula for recomputing base points. We now have two more little properties about this AUC function that are interesting. And it's this. First one is that no width. A U C A sorry F A of A equals zero. All right? If X equals A, then I've done nothing. I've got no width. Now, this other one. If I want to flip two points, right? I've got two arbitrary points. One of them, uh, either one can act as a base point. They're both in D, okay? If I'm doing this statically, if I take A U C F A of B and I flip the endpoints, I flip the sign. Okay? How do we feel about those two little things, one to five? Okay, and we'll get into this more, but those are two new properties of AUC that we get for free. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk about antiderivatives. I know I didn't put an outline up. I had technical issues that, you know, wasn't able to get it done. Okay, let's talk about antiderivatives. I, hopefully I get to the intuition behind AUC today. If I don't, then uh, estimating AUC. Uh, if I don't, I don't. Okay. So, an antiderivative. Now, this is actually very important, and that this is different from the book. So the book, and I'll, I'll talk about the, why this is different from the book. And don't worry, if, since I'm the person who wrote the final exam, you won't run into the situation um, on the final, um, because I wrote it. And if something changes, I will give you a heads up. But I am only going to find antiderivatives on an integral. Okay? That's very important. Uh, for well, it, there's a landmine sticking in the bot in the in the in the in the, in the there's a landmine that's just waiting for you to step on it. Um, and I'm going to like dig out the landmine and show it to you. Um, instead of having you step on it. So by doing this, but by saying that I'm only defining d on an interval, I'm also avoiding the landmine. But then I will be digging it up and showing it to you. Okay. G is an antiderivative derivative 
for f if g prime of x equals f of x for all x in p. Okay, how do we feel about that definition, one to five? Okay, just any function whose derivative is that. So if f of x example, f of x equals uh, cosine of x and antiderivative would be sine of x plus 4. And this would be d equals negative infinity, infinity, because this thing's defined everywhere. Everyone on board with that? It's just some function. I don't care what it is. Some function, it could be any number, right? It could be z it could be zero, it could be 18, it could be pi, right? Sine of x plus pi is a perfectly good antiderivative for g for f. Alright? But this is an antiderivative. The antiderivative, and this language absolutely stinks. Okay, and it should be the general antiderivative, but no one actually says that. They say the antiderivative. I mean, WebAssign says it. They're good. The book actually says the general antiderivative. That's awesome. Um, but you don't always get the word general. What you get is the article the, right? So, you know, when I'm thinking about the house, I usually think about a specific house. But no, 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 no. The house means the set of all houses. Okay. Not a representative of the set. It means everything. The antiderivative of f is all, is the collection, is the set of all functions In other words, the antiderivative would be the set g of x such that g prime of x, it should actually be g, not g of x, g, the set of functions g, the set of functions g so that g prime of x equals f of x for all x in p. Okay? Now, we had this theorem that showed up on your exam that said that if two functions have the same derivative, they differ by nothing but a constant. So I'm going to write this whole thing As this notation, because of our theorem, I get new notation. I can just write this as g of x plus c, where c is the generic constant. Right, we had that theorem that said that if two functions, right, we had that theorem.
So that was actually on your e exam. It was the last true false. Okay, let me do an example. Okay, how do we feel about that one to five? The difference between an and the, right? Which is totally not what it should be. Okay, I've got this generic constant that I'm using to stand in for this, right? So this right here, so I can say that F equals G of G plus C, so that G prime equals F and C in R. So this is the exact same. This set here, these two sets are equal, right? And hence the notation. So just like when we don't actually write the for every X all the time, we also um, don't write the set bar and all of the other things. Okay, we just write the C. So we just write it as G of X plus C. Okay. Yes, but they differ by at most a constant. Okay, so that means that they're vertical shifts of each other. Antiderivatives for the same function are vertical shifts of each other. Okay, and that was on that was that thing that we did the last thing that we did before the test. No, it wasn't the last thing. Let's see where did we do that. That was this thing. If for all x and d, f prime of x equals g prime of x, then there exists a constant c, so that for every x and d, g of x equals f of x plus c. In other words, two functions, if they have the same derivative, are nothing but vertical shifts on the same interval. Okay. It's a good question. Okay. Let's do. Uh, any other questions? So tips for antiderivatives. One, write a chart. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make myself a little chart. All right, and if you don't think that I did this on my test when I finally actually did a good job in calculus, you know, and calc two and everything, I don't remember all these antiderivative rules. Okay, the way I do it is I write them on the front page of my exam. Okay, and that's the way I did it when I finally did a good job in calculus. Remember the first time I did this, I came in full college. We won't talk about that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a chart. I'm going to have my F. I'm going to put my G on the left. I'm going to put my F on the right. And now I'm just going to list my little G's. So before test four, this should go on your front page. Well, you know, while you're taking test four, you know, the first thing you should do is write down this chart. Sign. The derivative of sine is what? 
cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. Okay? I want to get rid of that negative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put negative cosine here. And that's going to give me negative sine, which is sine. Okay, e to the x, I take its derivative, I get e to the x. If I do ln of x, I take its derivative, and I get 1 over x. So the antiderivative goes this way. I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. Okay, which other one should I throw out there? x to the c, where c is constant, cx to the c minus 1. Any others? Tangent, yeah, let's put tangent up there. Tan of x, and I'm going to get, uh, so that's tangent, and this is going to be 1 over cosine squared. Any others? How about our old favorites here? Arc sine. Negative one, I'm sorry, one over square root of one minus x squared. I actually have to think about that. I have to do the proof in my head. I can never remember it. Um, x to the x, that one's nasty. Okay, we could do it, but that one's just nasty. Um, in other words, I'm not going to be asking you something like that on the test. And uh, not all of these things have nice antiderivatives, okay? Antiderivatives sometimes aren't pretty. All right, so how do we feel about that one to five? Yeah, I'm going to put tan, arc tan and all the others on there too. But that's what I'm going to do. So one to five, how do we feel about this technique? Okay, the technique, our first antiderivative technique is to, de is to write a list. Just write a list because it's easier to go from this side to this side. It's easier to go from this side to this side. This side to this side is easy. This way to this way is hard. So what I want to do is I want to make my life easier. Okay, and I make my life easier by simply, you know, um, I just make my life easier by making a table, a chart. And I stick it, the first thing I do when I take my exam, I open my exam and I write on the back of the front page, sine, cosine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, sine, e to the x, e to the x, ln of x, 1 over x, x to the c, cx to the c minus 1. I don't usually need to write that power rule because I remember it. Tan, 1 over cosine squared, arc sine, arc tan, arc cosine. I just write them down. Deal with exponents first. Okay. Deal with constants in the exponents first. How do we feel about that, 1 to 5? Let's do an example. Oh, by the way, there's other notation for the antiderivative. It's not just f. Other notations. Uh, let me write this real fast here. Other notations. You see uh, F, uh, you sometimes see the G, um, you sometimes see F negative 1, right? Because remember that F 
to the with two or five in parentheses means the fifth derivative. If I take a negative derivative, what does that mean? It means I'm taking an, an integral or the the antiderivative. I'm not supposed to use the word integral yet. I will get to another notation for it. The integral notation we will get to. Uh, but these are other notations that you can see. Okay, so that f to the negative one business, that's because it's the negative prime. Uh, and you can sometimes see this before I forget about the other notations. All right, so our example. I've got cosine of x plus 10x, not 10 to the x, 10x squared. Okay. So now I want to compute f. So I'm going to do f of x now. I've got cosine I can deal with here. I look back at my chart, and I see that the deal with the cosine, I'm going to deal with sine. Okay? So that part's easy. That's going to be sine of x. Now I'm going to deal with the exponent first. This is x to the cube. Now, if I took the derivative of x cubed, there'd be a 3 in front. So I'm going to put the 1 third there, and then I'm going to add the 10. And then I'm going to multiply by the 10. So I deal with the exponent first, and then remember the fact that I need to go backwards. And then I'm going to add my c. And then step 3, always check. And I do mean always. Always check. If that antiderivative is take the antiderivative of x, you wind up with one half x squared plus c, take the derivative. Always, always, always. Okay, it will save you huge amounts of time if you do it quickly. I mean, it will save you huge amounts of time on your test because you won't be making mistakes. Okay. So I'm going to take the derivative. I get cosine of x plus, and then this thing becomes the 3. So this becomes 10 times 3 over 3, which is 1x to the squared plus 0. And that's the same thing. And then I check to make sure those two things are equal. 1 to 5, how do we feel about this method? There are antiderivative word problems. I'm not assigning them yet in WebAssign because I want to deal with the AUC way of dealing with them first. And I want you to show I want to show you that the two methods of dealing with them are equivalent. Okay? So I want to save the word problems for later. The solve for the C thing. Um, they are on there. I may assign one with the video, but um, I want to, and then I'll say watch the video for it first. But I really want to save those things for next week uh, when we play with the word problems with integrals. Um, okay, with definite integrals. All right, um, I'm not going to get very far. I've got five minutes. Well, no, I've got less than five minutes left because I started late. Uh, but I'm going to steal five minutes of your time. I'm sorry I was late this morning to talk about the other thing. Um, and that is the intuition behind the, the estimation. And this problem goes back to the ancient Rome, to well, a long time ago. Uh, it actually goes back further than the, the Romans. It goes back to uh, the Greeks and probably further. But what I want to do is I want to measure the area of a curve. So Archimedes came up with this clever way of doing it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put little pieces of this curve. Inside, I'm going to build up the little pieces. I'm going to do that with rectangles. Okay? So what I'm going to do is on the inside, I'm going to have a, a rectangles, right? If I start, oops, it went way too fast. It's still going way too fast. There we go. So I'm going to start by having one rectangle 
by having rectangles underneath. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up into these intervals. Okay? So I'm going to break it up so that this interval here, this piece here, this piece here, I'm going to have four of these. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my number of rectangles. So right now I have an estimation for the area inside the circle. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another one and then another one and then another one and then another one. And so every time I do this process, okay, I get closer to the actual area of the, of the thing. So what I'm doing is on the inside, I'm adding more rectangles. I'm making my interval over which I'm doing this, and I, I hate that I can't point well. You see, now instead I'm using this as a rectangle, which has no height, this interval, this interval, this interval, this interval, this interval, this interval, this interval. And what I'm going to wind up with when I do this is a closer and closer nu number I wind up with a closer and closer estimate of the value. Um, you can't see this because I can't seem to make this. That gummit. There we go. So what I'm going to wind up with is a closer and closer to the value. So here I'm using 10 rectangles. And I get an estimate of 1.38. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add more rectangles. And when I add more rectangles, I take the area of those rectangles. So if I add 20 rectangles, I wind up with a 1.4 something. And now I'm going to add more rectangles and more rectangles. And look what happens to that number. Right? It gets closer and closer to the actual area. Okay. Let's do another one. Um, shoot. There's supposed to be in this code, there's supposed to be list like there was the number. There's supposed to be the number is supposed to be represented on all of these, but it's not. Um, because this is the old version. The 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 new version is actually on my computer at my office. Um so let's see. So sorry about that. Uh, let me see. Got approximate there. Did I use that same thing? Yes, I did. So approximate iterations. Uh, lower normal iterations. Output equals animation. Show area. I want that to be true. There we go. So right now, my estimate of the area is this. But then, as I increase the number of rectangles I'm using, I'm getting a different value. So 1 to 5, how do we feel about that? As I increase my number of rectangles, I'm going to get a closer and closer to the actual area of that half circle. Okay. Well, I can do the exact same thing here. But this time, I'm going to have my circle. I'm going to estimate, overestimate the thing. So here, what I'm going to do, I've got an overestimate. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add more. So I had an underestimate. I had a consistently underestimate from before. And now I'm going to have a consistent overestimate. And notice how I, as I add more rectangles, notice how this number here 
notice how the number here starts to look like the number here. As the animation runs, the two numbers converge. Okay, how do we feel about that, one to five? Okay. Same thing here. I do the exact same thing. This is a different curve. So instead of just talking about circles, now I'm talking about the curve x squared over 2 plus 1 half. And if I want to estimate the area under the curve with a base point of negative 2, what I'm going to do is I'm going to freeze the situation, and then I'm going to add all these little rectangles. And what I'm going to get is a, is a closer and a closer approximation to what the, inner, the area actually is. And I could do the same thing from above. And I get this. All right. And if the thing is integrable, right, if the area under the curve function here, if, if the function has certain properties, one of them being cont continuity, if the function is continuous, this is beautiful, right? I always will get the, the, what will happen if the functions are continuous, this number when I estimate from over and this number when I estimate from below have the exact same value, right? As the limit. As I take a limit, as I go to infinity on the number of rectangles I'm using, if, I, if, the, thing, if the thing is continuous, right, I wind up with the area... I wind up with the top area converging with the bottom area as, as I go to infinity. The same thing happens, but I don't always have to use the left or the up or down. Okay, we're going to define it using up or down, but it actually works if I take left endpoints, if I take right endpoints. So here's left endpoint. I'm sorry. Here's uh, uh, left endpoints, and here's right endpoints. And it works if the thing is continuous. It doesn't matter which ones I use. As when I take the limit, as I go to infinity, the numbers all come out to be the same. How do we feel about that one to five? So what I'm doing is I'm estimating the area under the curve with a fixed x. I've got a fixed a on one end and a fixed x on the other. Okay. So my area under the curve function is going along, it's sweeping out area. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. My area under the curve function is going along and sweeping out area. I'm going to freeze it. And I'm going to say, okay, what is the value of the function for this particular A and for this particular X? All right, and that's where we're going to pick it up next time. We'll do, we'll talk a little bit more about this. There's a question on the peer leading packet, though, that asks you to use a right endpoint estimation. Okay, so I went five minutes over from, after being five minutes late, I then went five minutes over. Are there any more questions? Okay, um, so I'm gonna jump off uh, Discord and set up for the next class and I will be in, uh, I will jump into voice chat if anyone wants to ask me a question.